It's really wonderful to be with you. If you are wondering about my accent, that's because I was born in the city of Nineveh. I'm the product of Jonah. So if you have any doubt about Jonah, just look at me and all doubts will be removed. I'm going to tell you that story this afternoon at two o'clock. So I really urge you all to stay of how I found Jesus on the streets of Baghdad. Uh, the story about 45 years old. Um, by divine appointment, I ended up being at the only Seventh-day Adventist church in the whole country. And I was beaten almost to death. I lost a uh, scholarship that covered four years of education. But that was 45 years ago. But about 13 years ago, I discovered I am alive today because I decided to follow Jesus. And then I started to see wonderful blessings that I never expected. One of them happened last year. The theme is, if we trust in Jesus, he will make all things to work for good for us. Um, I'd like you to look at your hands. You know, some hands are big, some are small, some are soft, some are callous. But hands can do wonderful things. When my son was growing up, his idol in life was Michael Jordan. So we bought him a basketball. The basketball was $26. But in the hands of Michael Jordan, that same basketball is worth $100 million. So you could see hands can do wonderful things. When my daughter was growing up, she got into softball and baseball. Well, the ball was $6, cheaper. But the same one in the hands of Alex Rodriguez is worth $26 million. So hands can do great things. Well, the greatest hands in all of history are the hands of Jesus. Uh, his hands did amazing and wonderful things. One day, he saw a leper. Uh, when you have leprosy, you have to be outside of town. And you have to scream and clean. Uh, nobody can touch you because it is very, very contagious. His wife never hugged him. His kids never came uh, close to him. But Jesus had compassion on him and touched him. And the power went from Jesus to him and made him well. Isn't that amazing? One day, there was a funeral of a little boy. Imagine the pain his mother went through. And the procession was leaving outside of the city into the countryside. And Jesus looked into the eyes of this mother and he had compassion on her. And his hand went inside the coffin, touched the little boy and brought him back to life. Now nobody can do that. That's impossible. Only the hands of Jesus can do that. Well, I'm going to tell you a story in the Bible today that is repeated four times about what will happen if you surrender something in the hands of Jesus. It's the story of the feeding of the 20,000 people. This story is repeated in all of the Gospels, which tells you how important it is. Very, very few stories are repeated four times, but this one is one of them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you will speak through me, that you will anoint me, and that uh, ultimately at the end, we will surrender everything into your hands. That um, our lives, our homes, our businesses, our possessions will all be surrendered to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible tells us that one day Jesus felt the need to be alone. So he went to a secluded place. And the crowd 
followed him. So rather than paying attention to his needs, he ministered to the crowd the whole day. And at the end of the day, there was a problem. So I'd like you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew. This is the first place where this story is told. Matthew. I have the New King James Bible, and at the top of verse 13, I have the heading, Feeding the 5,000. Actually, this is not very accurate. Because if you read verse 21, it says, Now those who had eaten were about, what, 5,000 men beside women and children. So if we go with the standard of our time, we have one husband, one wife, two children, that will make the total number of people 20,000 people. But really, in their time, they had a lot more than just 1.8 children. They had 12, 15. In fact, Jacob had 12 boys and one girl. But we will go with the standard of our time and say the crowd was about 20,000 people. So Jesus spent the day ministering to them. Let's pick up the story at verse 15. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. We have a problem. The way we're going to solve the problem is send the people away. But Jesus said to them, verse 16, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. Five loaves of bread and two fish. And we got a crowd of 20,000 people. Jesus said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples gave to the multitudes so they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Uh, go with me to John chapter 6. There is a slight addition here. John chapter 6, verse 6. That's the equivalent of six months of wages for one individual, 200 denarii worth of a bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. So one group said, send them away. The other group said, look, even if we work for six months, we're not going to be able to feed them. This is an impossible situation. There is nothing we could do about it. One of his disciples, that's verse 8, Andrew Simon Peter's brother said to him, verse 9, there is a lad here. What is a lad? A boy, a little boy, maybe 10 years old. There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? So we got five barley breads and two fish. And you have a crowd of 20,000 people. And there's nothing we could do about it. The only solution is send them away. Get rid of the problem. Well, Jesus said, give me 
the bread and the fish. And basically what he did was he took the bread, maybe it was like pita bread, he prayed over it, he blessed it, and then he cut it in half. And miraculously, every half became a full one. And he did that with the bread, with the fish, till a crowd of 20,000 people, that's a lot of people, were fed. And they were 12 baskets of leftover food, one basket for every one of the disciples who doubted that Jesus can do anything. So I'm going to share with you two lessons and then tell you a story that changed one of the churches that I pastored. The first lesson is the disciples lived in a world of very limited possibilities. There's nothing we could do about the problem. Send them away. Get rid of the problem. But Jesus lived in a world of unlimited possibilities. He could do everything. With Him, He was able to feed the crowd when he prayed. He blessed it, took it in his hand, and cut it into pieces. The greatest problem we face is to forget that God has led us in the past and that he will always be with us forever. Notice that the Bible really does have a humor in it. Uh, the story I just read came from chapter 14. Go with me to chapter 15 now. Logically speaking, the events that took place in chapter 15, you will assume happened shortly after what took place in chapter 14. In chapter 15, we have identical situation. Uh, in my Bible, at the top of verse 32, it says, feeding the 4,000. So, uh, let's read verse 32 and 33. Now, Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitudes. So we have a, a crowd now of 16,000. 4,000 men, women, another 4,000, kids, 8,000. Uh, I have compassion on the multitudes because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Well, you just saw him doing it. Maybe a couple of days earlier you saw him doing it. And you read about him doing it for two million people in the desert for 40 years every day for three meals. This is one of the greatest challenges we have, is to forget to have a spiritual amnesia. They were standing in a front of God who could do the impossible. And they said, where could we get enough bread to feed? such a great multitude. Perhaps one of the challenges for us to forget that our God can move mountains, can do the impossible. Whatever mountain you have, God is bigger than that. The other lesson is that the blessing 
took place because of a little boy who was willing to give of his lunch. We don't know anything about this boy. We don't know his name. We don't know his tribe. We don't know his address. All what we know is his generous heart. Actually, we know one thing about him. He came from a poor family. How do we know that? Because he only had five loaves of barley bread. And at that time, barley was for the poor. Wheat was for the rich. And the other way we know is that he only has two fish. So he had to eat three pieces of bread without anything in them. But still, in spite of all of that, he was generous. One day, as uh, Pastor Gary mentioned in the sermon, one day Jesus was in the temple. He saw a woman giving two pennies. And that registered in his mind. And he made it to the Bible. And that woman became an inspiration to all of us to give. So it's not about the size of your giving. It's about your heart. It's about your willingness to give. And whatever you give, even if it is two pennies, even if it is five loaves of bread and two fish, in the hands of Jesus, it would be a great miracle. Anything you submit into the hands of Jesus, whether it is uh, your voice, your money, your talents, he will multiply it and make it a great blessing to others. Well, on a Friday afternoon, my conference president called me. He said, Pastor Joe, I'm going to be in your area on Wednesday. Can we go out to lunch? I said, I will go out to lunch with you anytime you want me, as long as you pay for it. <laughs> so on Wednesday, we went out to lunch. And there was a lot of chit-chats. And I knew there is more to this lunch than just... Uh, talking to me about this and that. So I'm waiting for him to get to the point. What, what is your point? Anyway, I'm waiting. Finally, he got to it. He said, we are really hurting financially at the conference. And we have to lay off three pastors to balance the budget. But the pastor of the district next to you accepted a call to leave the conference. So we thought about giving you one of his churches and giving his other church to the pastor on the other side. So in this case, we only have to lay off two pastors. Well, I said, no problem. I would love to have another church. Tell me more about it. He said, a group of German immigrants came to this valley next to you and they built the most magnificent church in the whole valley. They grew to about 120 people. They built a wonderful auditorium, uh, a school, community service. And as I was hearing him, I noticed a trend. Everything he said was in the past. So I said to him, what about today? What happened to this group of people? Oh, he said, because of internal conflicts, that group of people, it would nil down to about 13 people. I said, that's fine. Uh, do they do any kind of outreach to the community? Oh, he said, the last time they did any kind of outreach was about 26 years ago. I said, do they have any kind of baptism? He said, the last baptism they have at that church was 20 years ago. I said, I don't want that church. 
He said, it is yours. It's our gift to you. That's what the executive committee have voted on. I said, okay. So I took that church. I went there the first Sabbath. I took my wife and my two kids. I didn't see 13 people. The highest number I ever saw was nine. But if you add my wife, myself, my two kids, that would make it 13 people. So they were at least people of hope. Well, in a preparation for my first board meeting, I went to my office many, many times. I prayed. I came up with a list of 10 things to revive this church. Finally, I went to the board meeting. And I... Uh, said to myself, you know, this is heavy. Before I get into this list, maybe I should start with something light. Uh, maybe an icebreaker or something. So I, I said, I noticed that at this church, we have no means of communication with each other. No email, no bulletin. It would be nice to know what's going on. Why don't we just start at least with printing a bulletin so we know the events, the, the program for the church. Head elder stood up. He was always in the habit of standing up every time he talked, and he talked with a very thick German accent. And he said, that is a ridiculous idea. We don't need any bulletins. There are only 13 of us. We know everything that needs to be done. And after all, that's not a good idea because it means we have to cut trees and this will, uh, you know, harm the environment. And he drifted into a lecture on the environment and how my 13 bulletins were going to destroy planet Earth. So I gave up. By the time he was done, I just checked out. I didn't care about anything. So I went back again to praying and going over my list, praying again and again and again. I went to my second board meeting. And I, I, I said, this is heavy. Let me start with something light. So I said, I noticed that we never have potluck here at this church. It would be nice to have a potluck so we could get to know each other and minister to each other. Head elder stood up. My heart went down. Every time this guy said anything, he ruined my day. I even avoided seeing him because of that. And he said, that is the worst idea I ever have heard in my life. I said, why? It's nice to eat with each other. He said, Pastor, you have to understand. We hate each other at this church. <laughs> and if we eat with each other, we will kill and finish each other. And he went on for a whole hour talking about all of the problems that they have had at that church. By the time he was done, I needed a psychiatrist. Well, in a preparation for my third board meeting, I tweaked my points. I prayed over them. I went to my third board meeting. This time, I learned my lesson. No more light things. I'm going to go straight to my agenda. So I said, I noticed that we don't have Sabbath school for the children at this church. There was a good reason behind that. Because there were no children at that church. And the youngest member in that church was a woman. Her name was Edna, and she was 81 years old. <laughs> that was the youngest person. But my idea was to go out in the neighborhood and invite the kids to come, have maybe some food for them, some crafts, some Bible, 
Hopefully they like it enough so they could bring their parents, their mom and dad. Head elder stood up. My heart went down. And he said, that's not a bad idea. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. And then he proceeded to say, as long as you will be in it, that's me. And he said, I was the worst pastor he ever have worked with in 80 years. And then he started to air all of my problems and attack me this way and that way. I got very, very discouraged, not only because of the personal attacks, but that, that man was killing the church. He was ruining it. So I left. And I was so discouraged. I called a friend of mine. And I started to cry on his shoulders, uh, figuratively, because he wasn't there. But I started to cry and explain to him the situation. And then uh, my friend said, I have the solution for you. He said, first, you need to pray the prayers of John Knox. John Knox was a reformer from Scotland. I said, I don't know his prayers. He said he prayed that God will give him Scotland or he would die. I said, I'm not praying this prayer. I don't want to die. It is not worth it for me. He said, you are not going to die. Just pray this prayer. He said, you have to claim that valley for Jesus. You have to claim the people of that valley for Jesus. So we stopped. And we started to pray. And after our prayer, he said to me, you know that story in the Bible about um, Jesus feeding the 20,000 people? I said, yes. He said, the miracle happened when the little boy surrendered his lunch to Jesus. He said, every time we surrender something into the hands of Jesus, expect nothing but a miracle. He said, your problem is you're taking it too personal. He said, it's not your church. This is his church. And the best thing you could do is just surrender it to him. And watch and see what he could do. So we prayed again and we surrendered that church to Jesus again. And I had a tremendous peace. It was wonderful. So the following day, I went to that church. I drove over there about 8 o'clock in the morning. I parked my car. And I started walking on the hills. The, the church was in a valley surrounded by hills. And I walked on these hills and I claimed that valley for Jesus. I did that every day except Sabbath and Sunday. Every day I went over there and I prayed. And then I said to myself, I really need to preach to this congregation about the importance of prayer. So I started to do that. And one day, my sermon was on intercessory prayer, praying for other people. Only one person caught the vision to pray for other people, and that was Edna, the youngest person in that church, 81 years old. Her husband had died two years earlier. She went home, she knelt by her bed and said, Lord, Pastor Joe today urged us to pray at least for one person. I don't know who to pray for. You tell me. And immediately the Lord said to her, I want you to pray for Michelle. 
Michelle was her neighbor, a young woman about 25 years old, but was in the habit of breaking all of the Ten Commandments every day a million times. She slept with a different guy every night. She was alcoholic. She, she did the drugs. She lived a terribly messed up life. So immediately Edna said to the Lord, that's the wrong name. Give me another one. And God said, no, that's the name you need to pray for. Well, Edna, she started to pray for Michelle. The first thing that God did was that he gave Edna love for Michelle. That's what really God does when we pray for other people. He gives us love for them. And then God started to show her different ways to reach to the heart of this young woman. He started to bake bread and take it to her, invite her over for a meal on Friday night or Sabbath afternoon. And really, the two of them blossom into a wonderful relationship. Uh, Edna became a mentor to Michelle. She started to disciple her and uh, blossom into just a very meaningful, deep relationship. One day, I went to the board, and this time I only had one item. So I went to the board, and I said, I would like to do an evangelistic meeting at this church. That elder stood up. My heart didn't go down this time because I surrendered the church to Jesus. It's his church. And the head elder said, we tried that 26 years ago, and it didn't work, and we're not going to try it again. And then he went like this, I am putting my foot down. There is no way we're going to do this. And he went on about how evangelism doesn't work. And I listened. And when he was done, I said, look, I will make a deal with you. You allow me to do this one more time. And if it doesn't work, I will never ask you for anything after that. He said, are you willing to put it in writing? So I have to sign a document that if this evangelistic meeting doesn't work, I'm never asking this church for anything. As soon as I left the meeting, I called my conference president. I said to him, look, this is a situation. And finally, we voted on to have an evangelistic meeting here. And I have three requests from you. First, every time you meet for any kind of committee, I want you to pray for us. He said, done. I said, would you please send an email to all of the churches so they could pray for us? He said, done. I said, would you please double the budget you give to a church like this? He said, I will triple it. This church hasn't done anything for 26 years. I could justify it. So we started to prepare for this evangelistic meeting. The evangelistic meeting was going to start on a Friday night. On a Tuesday of that week, Michelle went hunting with her mother. She drank, she became disoriented, and she shot her mother mistaking her for a deer. The mother survived. She was shot in the arm. But the experience shook her up. I mean, as you could imagine. For comfort, she went to Edna. And Edna did a marvelous job ministering to her. She even had her stay in her house. She comforted her. She prayed with her and for her. And on a Friday night, she brought her to my meeting. On a Friday night, I went to the church about 5 p.m. 
I set up my slides. They were on the second coming of Christ. And I, uh, the church had only two sets of pews. This has four. So I knelt down in the first one, and I prayed that the pew would be filled with people, went all the way back, praying for every pew, and came from the back to the front on the other side. And then about 15, 20 minutes to, uh, to 7, I came here and waited for the crowd to come. And my faithful nine came, and Edna brought Michelle with her, and no one else came. No one. We advertise. We send flyers. We put it in the paper, on the radio. We put posters all over town. No one came. And I said, Lord, why would you do that to me? I was very upset. And I started to argue with the Lord. And I said, this will be the end of this church. I can't ask for anything anymore. Well, finally, I said, I have to preach. And the slides were on the second coming. So I opened my mouth. And God shut my mouth. I couldn't say a single word. So I tried again. And nothing came out. And then I heard the voice of God in my head saying to me, forget about the second coming. Preach about my love. And I preached for 45 minutes a sermon I did not prepare for. He gave it to me. I preached about the love of God in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. I preached about the love of God in my life. How he found me and rescued me. And I kind of knew who Michelle was. So I looked at her one time and I said to her, look, God is not interested in your past. But God has a wonderful future for you. I said to her, one of the specialty of Jesus is making a new people out of us. That's what Jesus does. He creates new people all the time. I said, if you accept Jesus, you will live in the forgiveness of sin. You will live in joy. You will have a new life in him. And then I gave an altar call. And Edna dragged Michelle to the front. And I prayed, and people left except the three of us. And Edna came to me and said, I would like you to explain the gospel to this young woman. So we sat right here in the front. The ladies were sitting there, and I brought a chair, and I sat across them. And I started to talk to her about the plan of salvation, how sin entered into the world, and how Jesus decided to take our place. And die for us. That's amazing. It's unbelievable. But it's true. Jesus valued your life by the value of his life. He gave his life so you could live and have eternity and enjoy God and his presence forever. I, I said to her, if you accept Jesus, everything will be new. And I will never forget it. About 2 o'clock in the morning, I saw the tears coming down her eyes. And she looked at me and she said, I don't have to sleep with a different guy every night to feel love. Jesus loves me. It's like the light of God started to shine in her life. Everything about her changed. And I saw... Edna hugging her and kissing her and crying with her, and I'm crying with them. And then she said, I don't have to do drugs to feel good about myself. Jesus loves me. And I saw the birth of a new person. 
radical transformation. So I looked at her and I said, Michelle, would you like to give your heart to Jesus? She said, yes. Well, I said, pray after me. And she prayed after me and gave her heart to Jesus. And then I went and got a Bible. And I said, uh, Michelle, I'm going to put a marker here at the Gospel of John. When you wake up in the morning, read chapter 1 and come back tomorrow night for the second meeting. We were all very tired. It was 2.30 in the morning. And we left. And the following night, about 5 p.m., I went back again to that church, did the same. I prayed from the front to the back, from the back to the front. And I came here uh, waiting for my nine people to come and Michelle hopefully to come. And my nine people came. And Michelle came, plus 54 more people came. 54 more people came. Here is what happened. Michelle took the Gospel of John. She read chapter 1. She read about the Word that became a flesh, and it dwelt among us. In the Message Bible, it says that Jesus loved us so much, he took permanent residency in the neighborhood of our humanity. What a beautiful way of expressing it. And she's amazed. She, she is uh, just thrilled to read. You know, in the Bible, it says, when people heard Jesus, they were amazed. So she went to chapter 2. And she read about the first miracle that Jesus performed and how the disciples believed in him. And uh, she knelt down beside her bed and asked Jesus to help her believe in him. She moved to chapter 3. And of course, in chapter 3, there is one verse that summarizes the whole Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the summary of everything. And she is thrilled. She's excited. She had not read anything like that before. And the word is gripping her. So she moved to chapter 4. She read chapter 4 and she quit. What is in chapter 4? The Samaritan woman. And, and Michelle said to herself, if the Samaritan woman in the Bible could do it, I could do it too. So she spent the whole day calling her friends and relatives to come to hear about Jesus. And 54 of them came. It was amazing. It was unbelievable. It was a miracle, really. And at the end of the meeting, Another miracle took place. Michelle got baptized, plus 11 more of her family. That happened in a church that have not have had any baptism for 20 years. They more than doubled overnight. And then I witnessed another miracle. God took two women. Nothing in common between them. One of them grew up in the church. Never rebelled. She didn't even know the meaning of that word. She played the piano for the church for 50 years. Even though she didn't know how to play the piano. But nobody cared because they love her. And that's it. That's what counts. And a woman that grew up on the street. And God put them together. And through their ministry and their prayer, I witnessed another amazing, unbelievable miracle. I had that church for five years. First Sabbath I was there, there were nine people plus my family. 
five years later, my last Sabbath there, the original nine were all, all there, which tells you I was a wonderful, fantastic pastor. <laughs> you, you know how you know that? Because not one of them died when I was there. I took, I took good care of them. Even though the youngest was 81. That's a miracle. And, and Michelle was there, uh, who has become a major leader of that church. Plus, my family, plus 189 more people. God did a wonderful miracle through prayer and through the ministry of those two women. Praise the Lord. Amen. God could do great things. We need to live in the worldview of Jesus. Where everything is possible. Not the worldview of the disciples. Where all what they look at is problems. Get rid of it. Send the crowds away. There's nothing we could do about it. Jesus said, I could do it. There is nothing impossible with him. There is one more miracle. How many of you are wondering about my head elders? Well, I mentioned that God changes lives, changes hearts, minds. He came to me at the end of the meeting and he said, Pastor Joe, can we do this again next year? God changed his life, his heart. That's what he is in the business of. The biblical story is about a little boy. My contemporary story is about two women. One in her 80s. How many are here are in their 80s and more? Let's see that. So we have a lot of people. How many are 10 years old? We have some. How many are 25? Or are in the 20s? Oh, you are not 25. <laughs> uh, friends, I want to tell you, it doesn't matter whether you are 10 years old or 90 or anywhere in between. Whether you are a woman or a man, a boy or a girl, it doesn't matter. If you surrender your life to Jesus, expect nothing but a miracle. That's what he has promised to do. He is the God of the impossible. Let's sing at least one verse of how great thou art. We're going to sing how great thou art. Here it is. And then I really uh, urge you to pray a prayer in your heart and surrender everything to Jesus. 